Hello librarians, my name is Saba Tahir and I am the author of All My Rage. It will be out on March 1st and I'm here to read to you from the first chapter. Thank you very much to the Baker and Taylor Children's and Teen Services team for having me. So, February, now Juniper, California. It's 6.37 a.m. and my father doesn't want me to know how drunk he is. Sal, are you listening? He calls me Sal instead of Salahuddin, so I don't hear the slur in his words. Hangs on to our civic steering wheel like it's going to steal his wallet and bolt. In the ink black morning, all I see of Abu's eyes are his glasses. The taillights of traffic going into school reflect off the thick square lenses. He's had them so long that they're hipster now. Mojave Desert Howler shakes the car, one of those three-day winds that rampage through your skin and colonize your ventricles. I hunch deep in my fleece, breath clouding. I will be there, Abu says. Don't worry, okay, Sal? My nickname on his lips is all wrong. It's like by saying it, he's trying to make me feel like he's a friend instead of a mess masquerading as my father. If Amma were here, she would clear her throat and enunciate Salahuddin, the precise pronunciation, a gentle reminder that she named me for the famous Muslim general, and I better not forget it. You said you'd go to the last appointment too, I tell Abu. Dr. Rothman called last night to remind me, Abu says. You don't have to come if you have the, the writing club or soccer. Soccer season's over and I quit the newspaper last semester. I'll be at the appointment. Amma's not taking care of herself and someone needs to tell Dr. Rothman, preferably in a coherent sentence. I watch the words hit him, sharp little stones. Abu guides the car to the curb in front of Juniper High. A bleach blonde head buried in a parka emerges from the shadows of Sea Hall, Ashley. She saunters past the flagpole through the crowds of students and toward the Civic. The pale stretch of her legs is courageous for the 20 degree weather. Also distracting. Ashley is close enough to the car that I see her purple nail polish. Abu hasn't spotted her. He and Amma never said, I can't have a girlfriend. But in the same way that giraffes are born knowing how to run, I was born with the innate understanding that I that having a girlfriend while still living with my parents is verboten. Abu digs his fingers into his eyes. His glasses have carved a shiny red dent on his nose. He slept in them last night on the recliner. Amma was too tired to notice. Or she didn't want to notice. Putter, son. Ashley knocks on the window. Her parka is unzipped enough to show the insubstantial Welcome to Tatooine shirt beneath. She must be freezing. Two years ago, Abu's eyes, <clears throat> sorry, Abu's eyebrows would have been in his hair. He'd have said, who is this Buddha? His silence feels more brutal, like glass shattering in my head. How will you get to the hospital? Abu asks. Should I pick you up? Just get Amma there, I said. I'll find a ride. Okay, but text me if... My cell's not working because you actually have to pay the phone bill, Abu. The one thing he's in charge of and still can't do. It's usually Amma hunched over stacks of bills, asking the electric company, the hospital, the cable company if we can pay in installments, muttering Ulu de Parte, sons of owls, when they say no. I lean toward him, take a shallow sniff and almost gag. It's like he took a bath in Old Crow and then threw on some more as aftershave. I'll see you there, I say. Take a shower before she wakes up. She'll smell it on you. Neither of us says that it doesn't matter, that even if Amma smells the liquor, she would never say anything about it. Before Abu responds, I'm out, grabbing my tattered journal from where it fell out of my back pocket, slamming the car door, eyes watering from the cold. Ashley tucks herself under my arm. Breathe. Five seconds in, seven seconds out. If she feels my body tense up, she doesn't let on. Warm me up. Ashley pulls me down for a kiss, and the ash of her morning cigarette fills my nostrils. Five seconds in, seven seconds out. Cars honk. A door thuds nearby, and for a moment I think it is Abu. I think I will feel the weight of his disapproval. Have some tamiz, but there, I see it in my head. I wish for it. But when I break from Ashley, the Civic's blinker is on and he's pulling into traffic. If Nora were here instead of Ashley, she'd have side-eyed me and handed me her phone. Not everyone has a dad jerk. Call him and eat crow. Arr, arr. She is not here, though. Nora and I haven't spoken for months. Ashley steers me toward campus and launches into a story about her two-year-old daughter, Kaya. Her words swim into each other and there's a glassiness to her eyes that reminds me of Abu at the end of a long day. I pull away. I met Ashley junior year after um Amma got sick and I dropped most of my honors classes for regular curriculum. Last fall, fall after the fight between Noor and me, I spent a lot of time alone. 
<clears throat> I could have hung out with the guys on my soccer team, but I hated how many of them threw around words like raghead and bitch and apu. Ashley had just broken up with her girlfriend and started coming to my games, waiting for me in her old black Mustang with its primered hood. We'd shoot the shit. One day, to my surprise, she asked me out. I knew it would be a disaster, but at least it would be a disaster I chose. She calls me her boyfriend, even though we've only been together two months. It took me three weeks to even work up the nerve to kiss her. When she's not high, we laugh and talk about Star Wars or Saga or the show Crown of Fates we both love. I don't think about Amma so much, or the motel, or Noor. Mr. Mock! Principal Ernst, a bowling pin of a man with a nose like a bruised eggplant, appears through the herds of students heading to class. Behind Ernst is security office Derek Higgins, a.k.a. Darth Derek, so-called because he's an oppressive mouth breather who sweeps around Jun Juniper High like it's his personal star destroyer. Ashley escapes with a glare from Ernst, but this is the second time I've pissed him off in a week, so I get a skeletal finger digging into my chest. You've been missing class. Not anymore. Detention if you're late. First and only warning. Don't touch me, I want to say. But that would invite Darth Derek's intervention, and I don't feel like a billy club in the face. Ernst moves on, and Ashley reaches for me again. I stuff my hands in the pocket of my hoodie, the stiffness in my chest easing at the feel of cotton instead of skin. Later, I'll write about this. I tried to imagine the crack of my journal opening, the steady, predictable percussion of my pen hitting paper. Don't look like that, Ashley says. Like what? Like you wish you were anywhere else? A direct response would be a lie. So I hedge. Hey, uh, I have to go to the bathroom, I tell her. I'll see you later. I'll wait for you. Nah, go on. I'm already walking away. Don't want you to get in trouble with Ernst. Juniper High is massive, but not in a shiny TV high school kind of way. It's a bunch of long cinder block buildings with doors on each end and nothing but dirt between them. The gym looks like an airplane hangar. Everything is a dusty, sandblasted white. The only green thing around here is our mascot, a hulking roadrunner painted near the front office, and the bathroom walls, which according to Noor are the precise color of goose shit. The bathroom is empty, but I duck into a stall anyway. I wonder if every dude with a girlfriend finds himself hiding from her in a toilet at some point? If I'd been hanging out with Noor instead of Ashley, I'd already be sitting in English class because she insists on being on time to everything. Boots scrape against the dirty tiles as someone else enters. Through the crack in the stall door, I make out Atticus, Jamie Jensen's boyfriend. He enjoys soccer, white rappers, and relaxed foot racism. I need 10, Atticus says, but I only have a hundred bucks. A lanky figure comes into view, Art Britman, tall and pale like Atticus, but hollowed out by too much bad weed. He wears his typical red plaid and black work boots. I've known Art since kindergarten, and though he hangs out with the white power kids, he gets along with everyone, probably because he supplies most of Juniper High with narcotics. A hundred gets you five, not 10. Art has a smile on his voice because he is truly the nicest drug dealer who has ever lived. I give what you can pay for, Addy. Come on, Art. I gotta eat too, bro. Art digs into his pocket and holds a bag of small white pills just out of Atticus's reach. A hundred bucks? For that? No wonder Art's smiling all the time. Atticus curses and hands over his cash. A few seconds later, he and the pills are gone. Art looks over at my stall. Who's in there? You got the shits or are you spying? It's me, Art. Sal. For a guy who careens from one illegal activity to another, Art is uncannily oblivious. Sal, he shouts, hiding from Ashley. His laughter echoes and I wince. She's gone. You can come out. I consider silence. If a dude is dropping anchor in the bathroom, it's rude to have a conversation with him. Everyone knows that. Apparently not Art. I grimace and step out to wash my hands. You doing okay, man? Art adjusts his beanie in the mirror, blonde hair poking out like the fingers of a wayward plant. Ashley told me your mom's up shit creek. <clears throat> Ashley and Art are cousins, and even though they're white, and I stupidly thought white people ignore their extended families, they're close closer than I am to my cousin, who lives in Los Angeles and insists all homeless people should just get jobs. Usually, while he drinks Pellegrino out of a ceramic tumbler, he ordered because Pixtagram told him that it would save the dolphins. Yeah, I say to Art, my mom's not feeling great. Cancer sucks, man. She doesn't have cancer. When my Nana Ethel was sick, it was miserable, Art says. One day she was fine, the next she looked like a corpse. I thought she was a goner. She's fine now, though, and she got a pain pillar prescription she never uses, so that's lucrative. Art's laugh echoes off the walls. You good? Because I could give you an old friend's discount. I'm good. Not even tempted. One shit-faced person in the house is enough. I hurry away just as the bell rings. The dirt quad empties out quicker than water down drain. As I turn the corner to the English wing, Nora appears from the other side. The sun hits the windows, painting her hair, her braided hair a dozen colors. I think of the pictures she has all over her room at her shithead uncle's house. Taken by a massive space telescope she told me about once. 
That's what her hair is like, black and red and gold, the heart of space lit from within. Her head is down and she doesn't see me, instead intent on raising the bell. We reach Mrs. Michael's door at the same time. Nora's face looks different and I realize after a second that she's wearing makeup. She pulls out her headphones hidden in her hoodie and a tinny song spills from them. I recognize it because Alma loves it. The Wanderer, Johnny Cash and you too. Hey, I say. She gives me a nod, the way you do when you've stopped seeing someone because you've got your own shit to worry about. Then she ducks into the classroom, a blur of beaded bracelets, dark jeans, and the cheap astringent soap her uncle sells at his liquor shop. For a second, the fight hangs between us, specter versions of ourselves six months ago, facing each other at a campground in Vale Meadows. Newer confessing that she was in love with me, kissing me. Me shoving her away, telling her I didn't feel the same, spewing every hurtful thing I could think of because her kiss was a blade tearing open something inside. Noor staring at me like I transform into an angry kraken. She had a pine cone in her hands. I kept waiting for her to peg me with it. The door slams behind her and I grab the handle to follow her. Then I stop. The bell rings. The hall clock behind me plods on, each tick a dumbbell slamming to the floor. A minute passes. I read and reread a sign on the floor for a writing contest Mrs. Michaels has been bugging me to enter. But even though I've walked into AP English every day for five months, today I can't make myself do it. I can't sit across the room from Noor, knowing she'll never tease me about my llama socks again or kick my ass in night ops four or come over on Saturday mornings and eat parata with me and Amma. I try to remember Amma's smile when she was well and would pick me up after class, the way she lit up and asked me about my life like I had climbed Everest instead of merely survived another day at school. She'd tell me now, my son, go inside. I sigh. And as I reach for the door, a bony hand grabs my arm. Mr. Malk! The hand slips from my grip. <clears throat> the handle slips from my grip. Ernst's pale green eyes bore into me, daring me to snap or wanting me to. What did I say earlier? He asks. Don't. I jerk away from him. Shut up, Salahuddin. Don't touch me. I wait for him to paw at me again. Suspend me. Call Darth Derek. Instead, he lets me go and shakes his head. A man sternly disappointed and a rebellious dog giving the leash a little yank. Incorrect, Ernst says. I said first and only warning. Detention, my office, three o'clock. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Baker and Taylor, so much for having me. I hope you guys get a chance to pick up All My Rage on March 1st.